welcome back from the break. Um, so my name is Christine Neiman. Um, as Justin um, introduced us all earlier, I am, but I'll give a little more background. I am the data management librarian at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, in Baltimore, Maryland, at the Health Science and Human Services Library. Um, and I am also part of the NNLM Region 1 office. So Region 1 covers as far north as Pennsylvania, New Jersey, as far south as North Carolina, um, and then over to West Virginia, Kentucky, um, and we include all the states, Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., thereabouts. So um, that I'm coming to you from Baltimore today. So, um, and I'm going to be talking about element four, which is data preservation, access, and associated timelines. So we're going to talk about what data preservation is, dive deeper into repositories, and also discuss how long and when, when data need to be shared, and how data can be made findable and accessible in the future. So I want to start with defining and differentiating data preservation and data storage. Data storage might be file cabinets full of records, a spreadsheet on a flash drive, or a data set and its accompanying protocols. Um, but so as you can see, there's a lot where data is stored can have varying degrees of security, privacy, and accessibility. Data preservation, on the other hand, is a series of managed activities necessary to ensure continued stability and access to data for as long as necessary. So data preservation requires more than a place to store or deposit data, but it consists of the activities that go beyond data storage to protecting the stability and accessibility of that data. So data preservation is what's essential for true data sharing. And ex so examples of what's required for data to be preserved uh, according to the NIH DMS policy is for the data to be stored um, or deposited in a secure location, for data to be stored in multiple locations. So if anyone's you know, familiar with the rule of three or locks, which is lots of copies, keep stuff safe, and for data to be shared in open file formats. So the format that, a format that will likely have the greatest use in the long term. So a great way, a great thing to remember is, you know, all data preservation is data storage, but all data storage is not preservation. Um, data preservation is a process, and choosing where to deposit your research data is going to be crucial to ensuring that ensuring that it is shared. So that overview. Um, really looking at the this element, element four, is really asking three questions. Where will your data be deposited and shared? How will the data be findable and identifiable? And when will the scientific data be available? For how long? And will portions of the data or certain data types be shared at different times? And we're gonna look at each of these questions. So first, you know, starting with where to deposit data and also how to make sure that it is preserved and shared. And when we talk about where to deposit and share data, we're gonna be talking about choosing a repository. So there are so many different kinds of repositories. I know we just looked at three of them um, and each, each one is a little different than the next one. And repositories can also work in a variety of ways. So, you know, for example, on the screen, these, uh, there's several different attributes of repositories. So, you know, repositories can be domain specific or generalist. They can provide different levels of access to the data. They may have different requirements for being able to upload or download the data. And there can be different modes and they can repositories can provide different levels of permission to access the data, such as controlled access, author approval required, or permission subject to IRB approval. Um, so again, this is just a sample of all of the attributes that the different, different um, 
different ways that repositories may operate. And repositories can also have limitations or restrictions on submitting or uploading data. So, you know, for example, restricted to a particular funder, requiring a specific data standard or only accepting certain data types. And some, some repositories may also require a fee, um, either at the time of submission or for access and use of the data by researchers after depositing. So, so choosing a repository may be the most important and most frequent question that you receive from researchers. If they have never shared their data before, one, they may want to weasel out of sharing, and two, when they realize they can't, um, they will have a lot of questions about how and where they're going to share their data. Unfortunately, the NIH has provided um, guidance on choosing the right repository. So throughout the process of writing a data management and sharing plan, you should be having conversations with with the researchers about where they will share their data. Is there a repository required by the NIH in their grant application? What subject or discipline does their research data fall into? And we'll hear a lot more questions when we have the, uh, a, a real life researcher interview later in today's uh, um, class. But you know, for just an example, like if a researcher came, came, came to me with a data set on alcoholism treatment for genetically engineered alcoholic mice, um, I'm gonna have to think about if this data belongs in an alcoholism repository or a mouse data repository. Um, you know, the researchers will know their data best, but it's also communicating with them about where their data is going, where to store their data, what will make, where to share their data, what will make the best, what will be the best place for them to share their data. So if there's not a repository required, the next best option is going to be one of the NIH supported or affiliated repositories for sharing scientific data. And particularly looking for a discipline specific repository, because again, that is gonna help with making the data reusable and um, as, people in that domain will then be able to, um, will know where to look for that data. So another option though, is if your institution has an institutional repository that can share and provide access to data, that is also another great, op a great option for researchers. Um, but you know, if there's still no NIH required and there's no institutional repository or domain specific repository that meets your data's needs, there's generalist repositories, which will generally accept data from a variety of disciplines and with a range of data types. So in the next couple of slides, um, I'm going to go over some of the examples of these different kinds of repositories. So and I, I know we heard about this earlier um, when Lisa was here talking about the NIH Biomedical Informatics Coordinating Committee, BMIC. BMIC has put together a list of repositories that are NIH supported or NIH affiliated. So here's um, just a few examples of NIH supported scientific data repositories. You know, we have the Gene Expression Omnibus, GEO, which is for genomics data, um, WormBase, which is for worm data, and Open Neuro for neuroimaging data. And here's actually a screenshot from that BMIC list. Um, and I'm going to actually open this, do a quick little demonstration to highlight a couple of its features. So can someone, it, I hope everyone can see the repositories for sharing scientific data. Yes, maybe. Yep. Um, great. <laughs> So there's two features I wanted to uh, just draw your attention to. And the first is that, um, you know, there's several fields here, several different attributes about repositories, um, but there's actually more than what we're seeing. <laughs> and um, this as part of the default view. So we can actually um, here toggle all of these on 
And now we get to see more um, description, more um, attributes of repositories. For example, the subject area, which is good to know if it's not immediately clear. Um, and also, you know, seeing if there's current NIH funding support and also like what kind of sustained support there might be. And then the second feature I would like to show you is, you know, we have this repository description. And this is actually a searchable field that will help you, can help you filter. Um, through different repositories when you're if you're searching for a specific repository. So, you know, going back to my earlier example, say I've got that um, data set on alcoholic mice, I'm going to search for alcohol. Okay, and one result has come up, which is the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism Data Archive. Um, but as I'm Reading through the description of this data set, I noticed that it's human subject study data. And it's also specifically funded from the NIAA. So this is not going to be a good repository for our data set. So instead, if I look for mouse, now there's actually several more mouse related data sets, um, which again, uh, Using the different fields to also narrow down into what um, what data what repository is going to be best for your data set. So you know, for example, I might pick the um, you know the mouse genome informatics repository is for you know database from a laboratory mice, but it's also facilitating the study of human health and diseases of which alcoholism is um, would fall under that. Okay, go back to back into my slides. Okay. So um, and I, I saw someone was asking for the link. Yes, thank you, Nicole. Um, so these repositories have all been at least vetted by the NIH. And they contain, um, you know, there are discipline specific ones. And it, at least, um, at least these these repositories at least meet some of the NIH's requirements to be considered um, an NIH supported repository. So they're not all NIH supported, NIH funded, but they have um, they've been assessed by the NIH. So now you know. So also in addition to that big uh, list of repositories, BMIC has also compiled a list of generalist repositories that are great for researchers whose discipline or domain area does not have a dedicated repository or a repository that accepts their type of data. So generalist repositories can accept data regardless of the data type, the format or content. And the NIH, while they don't you know, specifically recommend a particular generalist repository, they, um, they have been involved in a webinar series that's actually hosted by the NIH Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative, GRAY, so which is made up of these, which is um, made up of these seven repositories are members of that um, initiative. Um, Dry, there's Dataverse, Dryad, Figshare, Mendeley Data, Open Science Framework, Bibli, and Zenodo. And we're not going to look any more closely at them, but um, I encourage you if you're in you know, if that's something you want to know more about is that I've also linked here to the webinar series that the Gray Collaborative has um, been doing, looking at different aspects of sharing data in a generalist repository. Okay, so, you know, if there's no, so we're back again. The, the first thing you want to be, when looking at repo, what, choosing a repository is always, you know, if there's a required repository. And then, you know, if there's an NIH supported repository that is going to fit your data set. And, you know, if you're still not having, still isn't right, looking at a generalist repository, but even those may not be the right repository for your data set. Um, so when it comes, so the NIH has actually provided this guidance to us on how to evaluate a repository. So here is actually a list of the 12 desirable characteristics for all data repositories. And I'm not going to look through all 12 of these, 
But there's a few I'll highlight and would pay close attention to when searching for or um, helping a researcher decide what the right repository is for their data. And um, this is these are the kinds of characteristics that you might look for when you're searching. There's other places to search for data repositories such as re3data.org and fairsharing.org. So these are what, you know, the things to keep in mind when assessing a data, a, a data repository. So the first one, um, the first one to look at is actually free and easy access. And um, the repository should, a repository should provide broad, equitable, and maximally open access to data sets and their metadata. And they should be free and allow for timely access to the data. So we're going to talk more about um, actually being able to access and reuse data when we get to element five. But it's also important, it's also important that a repository where researchers share their data meets legal and ethical requirements, as well as maintaining the privacy and confidentiality of sensitive data. So and then okay, so secondly, there is um, clear use guidance. And just as repositories should follow legal requirements to protect the data, they should also have clear documentation for how the data can be accessed and used. You know, there may be particular licenses that limit the uses of the data or access to the data may need approval by a data use committee. May have to review the data use agreement. Um, especially for researchers working with sensitive data, they may want to explore controlled access repositories where a researcher is required to request access to a data set and often state how they intend to use the data. And that's this is something we'll return to um, in element five as well. And just lastly, I wanted to highlight um, of the in the of the in our 12 um, 12 char desirable characteristics is to look at a repository's retention policy. And we'll definitely, we're actually going to talk more about retention policies when we discuss the associated timelines part of element for, of this element of element four. So that was all about choosing repositories. Um, and choosing a repository is the most important part of element four. Um, but we also need to talk about how will a data be findable and identifiable? And how is any data or information findable through metadata? And specifically for data being shared through the use of unique persistent identifiers or persistent unique identifiers, PIDs, can use these things almost interchangeably. <laughs> um, the idea is that, you know, unique and persistent. So, and you can read here on the screen, you know, different definitions of a persistent identifier. Um, and you actually may recall that the unique persistent identifiers are another of the characteristics, desire another of the desirable characteristics for choosing a repository. And sharing data through a repository can, can actually be one of the biggest benefits to researchers because most repositories will assign a unique persistent identifier or PID to a data set that they, that they um, ingest or that they accept. So which can then be not only findable, but trackable, shareable, and citable. And I imagine that most of us are familiar with digital object identifiers, DOIs, and you know, open researcher and contributor IDs or ORCIDs, um, which are specifically, which are specifically for people, you know, researchers and librarians and anyone, um, but that can be linked to journal articles and other publications, including data sets. So unique persistent identifiers, DOIs, these may be new concepts to researchers, um, maybe words they've heard before but didn't fully understand. 
And it's really important that um, that they have some understanding of what the PID is. Um, but what the section of the D, what this section of the data management and sharing plan is actually asking for is just what are the persistent unique identifiers that will be assigned to the data. So, you know, what what is what ID will be assigned to the data to, and it does have to be something that is persistent. You know, the data does have to be findable and identifiable persistently um, in, into the future, as we'll see with the next question, which is like the last part of this element. Um, so yes, the last part of this element is associated timelines. Um, what does that mean? So it means that researchers will need to include when their scientific data will be made available to other users, what portions of the data and when those will be shared, be that with the larger research community institutions or the broader public, and for how long, um, how long the data will be shared. But first we'll look at um, when will the data be made available. So looking at the when, the policy states that shared scientific data should be made accessible as soon as possible and no later than the time of an associated publication or the end of the award support period, whichever comes first. And now we'll unpack that. So no later than the time of publication um, and Nina talked to us about what the different data types are and that what data types are shared, what data types are part of a publication, the difference between the publication and the data itself. But a publication triggers the release of the data that underlies that publication. This means that researchers must share, share the data reported on or used for an associated publication. But it is also important to realize that as we, we saw, not all the data does not always lead to a publication. And many portions of a data set or certain data types may not be directly used for an indiv individual publication. And in fact, some, may res some, re some researchers may want to hold back or even discard data that doesn't lead to proving a hypothesis. You know, what use can the data have if it didn't answer my research question? <laughs> But the NIH does not see the data this way. They state, we believe the scientific data underlying all NIH funded research to be of importance, particularly to serve the purposes of accountability and transparency. So remember that the core motivation for this policy is to increase the sharing of scientific data and work towards shifting the culture around research toward more open science, open data practices. So for that data that does not form the basis of a publication, um, all of that data is still required to be shared by the end of the award period. So this is the whichever comes first. <laughs> um, you know, portions of the data or certain data types that are not included in a publication should be shared by the end of the grant award period. And this will, you know, this will depend more on the grant itself. So I mean, grants vary in their length, how many years an institution receives funding for a particular project. This will all depend on um, a specific research grant, um, as well as institutional or publisher policies. Um, but what's, you know, what's important is like that, so that, you know, that will depend on the grant, but what's important is that researchers can follow both of these timelines, sharing the data for publication at the time of publication, and sharing data that's not in a publication at the end of a, the award support period. And again, that's what the policy is asking, is asking for in this, in this part of this element is to know what those timelines are. And that is also going to be part of the next, you know, the next kind of the, the sub question, if you will, that's part of element. 
the associated timelines part of element four. So when to share the data will depend on what is being done with the data. And for how long the data is shared is dependent on how long researchers anticipate that the data being useful to the larger research community, institutions, or the broader public. So researchers are encouraged to consider relevant requirements and expectations. For example, you know, different repository policies, award record retention requirements, journal policies, et cetera, as like a guidance for the minimum time frame that scientific data should be made available. But in reality, um, but in reality, how long the data is shared and made available will likely depend on the repository more than anything. Um, will likely depend on the repository that is storing the data. And so, you know, this is where we come back to data retention policies. Most repositories should have a data retention policy that states how long they will store the data. Um, and so what the researchers, what, what this part of the polyan what need to do when writing um, their DMSP is to identify the different timelines for their data sharing. And this is a really rough example, so forgive me, but think of it as data type A published from this project will be shared in X repository, which retains data for Y number of years. And data types B, C, and D will be shared in X repository at the end of the grant cycle. So again, that's pulling in, so that's both of the different timelines, the, the directly after publishing, um, and then, you know, at the end of the grant cycle or grant award period. So also important to think about, um, and also important to think about in looking at portions or subsets of the data is the timeline for sharing, um, sharing subsets or portions of the data that may be impacted by sensitivity of the data. So especially if there's, um, especially if the data contains human subjects research. But to be, I mean, to be clear though, just because a data set may contain sensitive data, like does not mean, oh, I just can't share my data. We wanna like maximize the data sharing. So Elizabeth to talk more about what limits there are for sharing data, like especially sensitive data and, things like privacy protection and de-identification, things that will make the data, will make it so that the data can be shared. I'm sure we're all ready to get onto that topic now, but um, one more aspect of repositories and data sharing that impacts how long the data will be available is a repository's sustainability plan. Um, so long-term sustainability was another one of the desirable characteristics characteristics of repositories. And repositories should have a plan for the long-term management of the data, um, including how, how they will maintain the authenticity, integrity, and availability of the data sets. So, and this is, um, when we were looking at the beaming list before, like, you know, seeing the sustaining support that repositories should have contingency plans for when unexpected things happen, and they need to have and be built on a stable technical infrastructure and have the funds to maintain that infrastructure long-term. Um, so again, this, this can all seem like a lot to ask for a, for a repository. Um, and finding all of this information is, is also good, maybe a challenge. Um, but that's why I, I just wanna reiterate again and finish this um, talking about this element and reminding everyone or reminding us that the NIH has already done a lot of this difficult work for us. Um, they've provided the list of repositories that, you know, are either NIH supported or, um, or at least been um, assessed or evaluated by the NIH that are acceptable and suitable for long-term data sharing. Um, so the BMIC list, the generalist repositories, the, the gray collaborative, these are all um, great places to find where you're going to be sharing your data. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to, I'm, thank you. Um, and I'm going to now turn things over to Elizabeth to take us through element five. Thank you, Christine. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen.
All right. So element five touches on access distribution and or reuse considerations. And this is the section where um, you have the opportunity to say why sharing may not be appropriate at all, uh, why sharing will have to be limited in some way um, because of the reasons that uh, Christine just touched on, but we're gonna go into more detail of that. So this is taken straight from the language of the policy. It says that element five is used to describe any applicable factors affecting subsequent access, distribution, or reuse of scientific data related to informed consent, um, which was mentioned early on in the presentation, how if a research project that has already been going on and um, there was no um, consent given initially for sharing, then obviously you can't do that in the middle, but something to consider for moving forward. Um, and that would be for uh, humans participating in research. Privacy and confidentiality protections that are consistent with applicable federal, tribal, state, local laws, regulations, and policies. And there is a supplement uh, specifically on these policies and how to handle them with sharing. And we have linked out to that in the slides as well. Whether access to scientific data derived from humans will be controlled. So a section on um, controlled access, we'll talk a little bit about data use agreements. Any restrictions imposed by federal, tribal, or state law regulations or policies and then any other considerations that may limit the extent of data sharing. And this has, um, I think, a common misunderstanding um, when individuals aren't don't know too much about this is this feeling of I'm required to share everything. This is the section to uh, say, like, reiterate, no, it's not that you have to share everything, it's that you should share as much as you can, but knowing there may be limitations and element five is where you will write all of those down. So these are the three subsections of element five. The first uh, factors that are would affect access distribution and reuse. Um, part B, whether access to scientific data will be controlled and part C, protection for privacy rights, confidentiality of human research subjects participants, sorry. And these obviously will sections speak to each other. So starting with section A, what does it say? NIH expects that in drafting plans, researchers maximize the appropriate sharing of scientific data, describe and justify any applicable factors or data use limitations affecting subsequent access distribution or reuse of scientific data related to informed consent, privacy, confidentiality, anything else. And fortunately, um, this is listed very straightforward, um, taken from the Frequently Asked Questions page on sharing um, NIH.gov. So here are some of those limitations. Informed consent will not permit or will limit the scope of extent of sharing and future research use. That the existing consent prohibits sharing or limits the scope that privacy or safety of research participants would be compromised or place them at greater risk of re-identification or suffering harm, um, where protective measures such as de-identification or certificates of confidentiality would be insufficient to protect the potential re-identification. Any explicit laws, and here is that supplement that I mentioned is linked in this slide. Restrictions imposed by existing or anticipated agreements with third-party funders, partners, et cetera, that you have to abide by, and that data sets cannot practically be digitized with reasonable efforts. So those are some reasons that can be listed here as to why you may choose not to share. There's also some examples of some non-justifiable reasons um, someone might say, uh, my data is insignificant, it's so small, no one's going to want to see that, so I don't need to share it. That's not a justifiable reason. 
it's also not justifiable to say that um, you don't think people will want to use it um, or there's no repository that's suitable to put it in. Those are not justifiable reasons either, as Christine mentioned, uh, or not mentioned, talked extensively about generalist repositories. There are options. Um, these things listed here are sound more like excuses as opposed to real justifiable reasons. So moving into section B, controlled access, and this is making the decision of um, making it more controlled for other researchers to have access to your data. Um, so that might be requiring an application and then giving approval, um, just having, having uh, limitations on how people can access the data. So it's still being shared, but it's being shared in a controlled um, an agreed upon way. And this is because of some data continues to be sensitive even after de-identification has happened, maybe because it can't be sufficiently anonymized um, or the scientific utility would be lost if you pull out so many um, of the variables that it's really, you know, isn't saying much anymore in order to protect the participant. So controlled access is a really good solution in those situations. And so the, the definition of de-identification is simply the process of removing personally identifiable information uh, from the data set. And then the definition of controlled access is a data sharing model that requires a request for access to all or part of the data set, even if de-identified and lacking explicit limitations. And that often happens between institutions, may have their own forms um, and processes for um, accessing data sets, um, as well as repositories that have controlled options. And then um, data access requests or data use agreements, those are two ways to facilitate the sharing of data under controlled access and to clarify the terms of use. So finally, in section C, we talk about uh, the protections that are being taken for privacy rights and confidentiality of human research participants. Um, and so this is just saying how, yes, I might, I'll de-identify de my data, I will have certificates of confidentiality and what those protective measures um, are. And like I said before, this may be repetitive. You may have um, spoken to this previously in this section. And so obviously privacy protection would be to follow HIPAA privacy rules, which require safeguards to protect privacy. Um, it said it limits and conditions on the uses and disclosures, as well as the common rule, also called the federal policy for protection of human subjects, uh, which is a robust set of protections um, to keep that confidentiality and anonymity of participants. And because this is such um, a big question that gets raised or just wanting to know in detail how to deal with this for researchers who are working with human participants, there is a supplemental, um, there's a supplemental sheet that we've linked to here that's specifically about protecting privacy with uh, human research participant data. So that is definitely recommended to check out. And in talking about de-identifying, that means pulling, pulling protected health information. And so here's just an example of the 18 um, PHIs or protected health information that would be pulled from a data set. And um, we wanted to share, a, actually, this is a National Library of Medicine tool called the NLM Scrubber, which helps researchers to do a first round of de-identification um, in a much quicker format than, um, say, putting your eyes to every single document. Um, it can do a first run through of identifying the PHIs that are in a data set. Um, very quickly to produce a HIPAA compliant data sets for research, publication, and sharing. Um, this works with electronic medical records. And so I have a screenshot here of um, some 
clinical notes that are from an electronic health record and you see in the first box the original note and then you see the redacted information in the second box where uh, it no longer has the personally identifying health information. And so it is just a great first run. Obviously you would want to double check it, but that it does a, a great job of processing through those um, clinical notes. So that's it, that was quick. Um, definitely check out those supplements to get more detail, but um, in some, you have the opportunity to say why you will not um, share some or all of your data and, and the why, and that there are multiple justifiable reasons for not sharing. Thanks. Okay, so now we're going to actually talk about our last element, so element six, which is oversight of data management and sharing. So the element is probably the least verbose um, out of the, all of the elements, and basically the text is describe how compliance with this plan will be monitored and managed, uh, frequency of oversight, and by whom at your institution, e.g. their titles and roles. Um, Somewhat recently, the NIH has uh, put a little bit of a caveat on this and have added an asterisk that says this element refers to oversight by the funded institution rather than the NIH. The DMS policy does not create any expectations about who will be responsible for plant oversight at your institution. Um, so this is just to say the policy does not prescribe nor create any expectations about who can or should be included in a plan under this particular element. However, it is helpful to note that the plan is part of the application, um, and as such, the institution, just like the application itself, is the responsible party for the plan and the rest of the application's content when submitting an application. So I do want to talk a little bit about PIs and managers. Um, so this comes from a very helpful um, article it's called 10 Simple Rules for Maximizing the Recommendations of the NIH Data Management and Sharing Plan. And it goes through all of the elements and provides some helpful information. So this article says, while PIs are ultimately responsible for data management, PIs are increasingly leveraging the skills and expertise of specialized information professionals to fill a dedicated data management or data manager role. The researcher's team's data manager is responsible for overseeing data as it removes from collection or querying to analysis, storage, and sharing, all while ensuring data integrity and protection of research subject privacy. So with that said, um, I did look at um, the contributor role ontology. Um, and basically, this is an ontology that's um, a derivative of the credit ontology. It's basically how people and authors get credit for their work during the research process. Um, basically, maps out roles for um, things like conceptualization of a project, data curation, analysis, project administration, validation. And this is just to name a few. So this contributor role ontology um, describes a data manager as a role that encompasses effective and efficient operation and usage of data, including but not limited to management, handling, or manipulation. Um, but we do know that there's much more people involved in the research process, um, including data managers, PIs, co-investigators, postdocs, graduate assistants, interns, biostatisticians, um, data analysts. You get the picture. Um, so. There are some roles, um, especially if you're doing research in clinical settings, to think about and really who can be involved with um, data management and oversight. So um, this comes from a paper called Data Management and Clinical Research, and they have a section on roles. Um, so these, as I mentioned earlier, can include data managers, but also we can think about data programmers, medical coders, um, clinical data coordinators, um, quality control associates, data entry associates, um, basically anybody that could be potentially having um, part of the data collection process, the input process, quality, you know, statisticians, things like that. Um, they do have another definition of a data manager, and they state that data managers are responsible for supervising 
the entire um, CRDM, so clinical research data management process. Um, the data manager prepares the DMP, approves the CDM procedures and all internal documents related to CDM activities. Um, and this is just one example. I think, you know, it's not, it, it's not a one size fits all model when it terms to over, oversight and responsibility. Um, but I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about some, um, some ways you can map up those responsibilities. Um, and so this is, I'd like to talk about uh, the sort of hierarchy of a research project. So we could potentially have a PI at the top, uh, but also research assistants and students entering the data um, could have a project coordinator that's che checking quality. Um, we can also have a statistician that's analyzing the data. Um, and we, I think it's really helpful to document those roles. So this is you know, not necessarily part and parcel of what needs to go in element six, but something that's really helpful for anybody that is trying to um, adhere to the policy in, as well as incorporate research data management best practices into their, um, to their project. So for example, if we think about a research assistant, maybe they're collecting data at a site or entering data into a database, um, but it may be helpful um, when you know, you're mapping out responsibilities is to say where, you know, try to distinguish where the gaps are. So does this research assistant need extra training? So do they need protocol training? Do they need to go talk to the IRB, um, data entry training, city training, database training, things like that. So these are things that are helpful to consider. Um, something else I want to talk about um, is called a responsibility. Oops a responsibility assignment matrix. Um, so sometimes these are referred to RASI charts um, and RASI stands for, it's an acronym that stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted and Informed. Um, so this is a chart um, that can be used to support uh, and clarify job responsibilities. So they um, take that acronym and apply it to certain people. So if a person may be responsible, fully responsible for a task, um, or are they accountable, or do they just need to be consulted? So it's a great way to map out um, the roles and responsibilities of a project. Um, it's really helpful because I think it allevi alleviates some confusion um, of people's expectations and sort of their deliverables. So you can, it basically looks like a Gantt chart <clears throat> um, where you have all of the people as well as all of the deliverables, or you can, um, you can flip that, it just, it depends. Um, and then it, you basically map out your whole project before it starts. Um, so who is gonna be responsible for what, which is really helpful. Um, in that vein, um, Coker just released, or I think uh, last year in November, released a really helpful roles and responsibilities spreadsheet um, for the NIH policy, um, which I think is great. Um, so this was part of chapter three. Um, it's a basically a downloadable Excel worksheet with detailed information about the stages in the process to support your institution's implementation of the NIH DMS policy. And it does have um, some elements from a RASI chart, which is really nice to see. Um, so institutions are strongly encouraged to customize this spreadsheet based on your institution's organizational hierarchy, level of decentralizations, offering areas of expertise, et cetera. Institutions will likely add or delete rows um, to fit their needs. Um, so you can see some of the responsibilities and activities in this first column. Um, and we also actually see the library here as well as you know, some other ones, some other um, sort of responsible parties. So you can um, you know, make this and, and edit it to fit your own needs. So with that said, um, there are some allowable costs for data management. Um, so these wouldn't go in this element, but it is, it is helpful and, and sort of bears um, highlighting um, that there is this allowable cost. Um, so the allowable costs are related to curation, preservation, and management um, that can be factored into the budget justification. And the budget justification goes into the budget, not into the DMSP. Um, but there are some related to um, element six um, in terms of things like curation, developing support for documentation, formatting data accordingly to accepted community standards, things like the identification, um, which Elizabeth just talked about, um, as well as preparing metadata to foster things like discoverability, interpretation, and reuse, um, some local data management considerations, um, and preserving and sharing data through established repositories, such as a data deposit fee. 
Um, so with that said, there are some things that are not allowed under budget requests, so they cannot include infrastructure costs. So these include um, things like institutional overhead. So, you know, you can't build a new wing hospital with, with this money. Um, so it can't go to administrative costs or facilities or things like that. Um, it can't go to costs associated with routine conduct of research, including costs associated with collecting or gaining access to research data. So you can't use it for th things like a, a data access fee or something like that. Um, or charges that are double charged or inconsistently charged as both direct and indirect costs. Um, so if you want to, um, to look through the documentation that they have on budgeting, you can use this link. And I think throughout this presentation, there was a few mentions of, of ways that you, or, uh, resources at least, that can help you budget um, these types of things related to data management. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.